Are you a victim? I guess I've heard this kind of terminology for the last couple of decades or so. And I hear that people are a victim of society. They are a victim of their circumstances. They are a victim of their upbringing. But they're a victim. This victim mentality can also affect us. There are times when we justify ourselves by looking at all the evil around us in the world, and then we're not necessarily alarmed when a little bit of that evil rubs off on us. Have you compromised a little bit in regard to what you will watch on TV? You know, maybe before you wouldn't watch a rated R movie, and now, eh, you know, that kind of, of transition. I heard it said recently, when you can't turn off the water, we get used to being wet. So, are we victims of society? This morning, I'd like to look in regard to this concept of being righteous in a wicked world. First of all, at Noah. Turn with me over to Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5 beginning. In Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. You think we have it bad. <laughs> I believe it has been worse. If it hasn't, you know, sin is still here as it has been for the millennium. Verse 6, And the Lord was sorry that He had made man on the earth, and He was grieved in His heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. So it sounds like God is just going to wipe the world out. But, in verse 8, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations, Noah walked with God. This word just here means lawful and righteous. So Noah is a, one, a man who keeps the commandments of God. Therefore, he is righteous. The word perfect here is defined by Strong's as entire, literally, figuratively, or morally, also as a noun, integrity, truth, without blemish, complete, full, perfect, sincerely sound, without spot, undefiled, upright, whole. So that is the definition of this perfect that Noah had. I do want to clarify, a couple of weeks ago I had a lesson on love, forgiveness, and unity. That was the title of the lesson. The lesson was intended to how do we respond when someone has done us wrong, we've done them wrong, and that, you know, that vice versa and how we should take correction. So, if you recall, I raised my hand, asked how many of y'all are perfect, right? And no one raised their hand, and I'm like, you're not perfect? We just partook of the Lord's Supper. We're in worship. Everyone agrees that we should be perfect, right? 
But the rub is, is that whenever someone says they're perfect, and even in that context, I said, you know, how arrogant of the person who would say that they're perfect. In the context of that lesson, what I was emphasizing is that we need to be perfect. We're commanded to be perfect. And in the process of being perfect, aspiring to perfection, failing from time to time, because that's where the correction comes from, right? Taking correction from someone else that we are trying to help one another unto perfection. To be righteous, holy, just, pure. That's what we're trying to help one another do. And so in that context, I would hope that we would all be perfect as Noah's perfect. What is alarming in regard to Noah is that he's perfect. When no one else is. He's not even getting any help from the brethren. And that was the purpose of that lesson. Was to talk about how we help one another be perfect in Christ. Holy, just, pure, righteous. And we'll talk about that as we continue. As you can see the lesson, righteous in a wicked world. But can you imagine that no one cares? In fact, they're offended that you're righteous. We have a, have a target on our back. That's the condemnation of Cain, as James writes, that his brother was righteous and he was wicked. That's why he killed his brother. So can you imagine the opposition, the loneliness, save his wife, his three sons and their wives? I mean, just your, your immediate family. Everyone else on the face of the earth is wicked. Let that sink in. (laughs) And so the lesson then was about helping each other unto perfection and that we should be perfect. That's the command. And we would see it over and over. And Noah was. And in fact, it says that he walked with God. This is the idea of walking along, behaving Noah was righteous. He was pleasing to God. Now, we cannot do that separated from Christ. In fact, it's an impossibility. We're only righteous, just, holy, pure, undefiled, without blemish in Christ. So, over in 2 Peter chapter 2, don't have it on the slide, 2 Peter chapter 2, Verses 4 and 5. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. So here's a man who is preaching righteousness. You've got to be righteous. There's going to be a consequence if you're not. I would suspect this is part of that that preaching. You might think of Jonah. And in 40 days, was it 40 days? Now I'm going blank. Okay, thank you. In 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. Thanks for that positive sermon, right? But they repented. And that's the whole point of preaching, is to preach the righteousness of God. And if you're over here and you're not righteous, you better become righteous immediately because we don't know when the Lord's going to return. And so Noah is doing that. He's preaching to others that they be righteous as he is righteous. Because that's what he is. Because he is following God. He's doing what God says in the midst of a wicked, wicked world. So wicked, God wipes out everybody. That's pretty wicked. The second is Lot. Same context. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 6. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, 
condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. So when we want to live ungodly, what we need to remember is Sodom and Gomorrah. Now I want you to notice the effects of Lot being in Sodom and Gomorrah, what it did to him. Remember, I said earlier, sometimes uh, since we can't turn off the water, we can't turn off sin around us, we get used to being wet. We just kind of get used to sin. And maybe cursing, maybe the Lord's name taken in vain just doesn't affect us like it used to, make us cringe wants us to hold our ears closed, maybe licentiousness. I I don't know if if people even look in the mirror before they walk out the door and go to Walmart. They're, They're wearing their undergarments from time to time. And that should bother us is the point. So he turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction. For an example to us, verse 7, and delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed with the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day in seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. So three times it states that Lot is righteous. This word oppressed here means to labor down. In other words, wear with toil, figuratively harass, oppress, vex. It was a constant bombardment of sin, of sin, of sin, over and over and over. And sometimes we just have the the mentality just to throw up our hands and why fight against it? And in verse 8, this word tormented means to torture, pain, toil, torment, toss, vex again. So it oppressed him. It beat him. And it tormented his righteous soul. He didn't get used to it. He didn't let it roll off his back like a water off the back of a duck. He didn't just let it go in one ear and out the other. It vexed him. We see in verse 9, then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. Keep that in mind that He knows how to deliver when it comes to us examining our second point. We can't claim to be victims. can't really get away with that. In regard to Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23-28, he mentions labors, prisons, five times. He was beaten with 39 stripes, beaten with rods, stoned, perils of all kinds, in and out. Weariness, toil, sleeplessness, hunger, thirst, fastings, cold, naked, deep concern for the brethren. In Acts chapter 9 and verse 16, he says, for I will show him, this is Jesus, excuse me, Jesus saying, for I will show him, Paul, Saul of Tarsus at the time, how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And boy, did he suffer. Over and over and over and over and over. But he remained righteous. He remained pure and holy. Did he ever sin? Well, I'm pretty sure he did. Some people put Paul on the pedestal because there's no written, there's no no uh, example of him ever sinning. Except at the beginning. And there's no, we cannot turn to a passage where Paul sinned after he became a Christian. Period. So I could easily claim Paul never sinned. Show me the passage, right? So, you think that he was disturbed? Of course he was. 
Do you think that he had any struggles? I'm pretty sure he did. You read Romans chapter 7, and I, I equate that to, to Paul. I don't think that he's, he's above sin by any means. And, uh, this, the, the context there is this, this idea that he does what, he does what he doesn't want to do, and he doesn't do what he knows he should do. <laughs> and don't we all struggle with that? And in that sense, none of us are perfect. But guess what? The struggle is the perfection. The struggle is trying to be the people we ought to be and that we should be. And don't we win? Don't we win over the temptation? Don't we win over sin? Don't we beat the the tar out of the devil? Don't we win the battle? And there's nothing to be ashamed about that. The Lord helps us all along the way. You who are spiritual, restore such a one. What does that mean to be spiritual? That means you're strong, at least at the moment, to help someone else. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1. Where's the shame in that? Where's the shame in preaching righteousness and holiness and purity? And so, we have to make the application. Here's six steps. We could certainly have more and maybe we could whittle it down to a few less, but six steps to overcoming a wicked world. In other words, to be like Noah. To be like Lot. To be like Paul. Great men. Men of high esteem. Men we look up to. In fact, isn't that the hall of faith? That's what Hebrews 11 is pretty much all about. Because Hebrews 10 is, you know, don't sin willfully. Hebrews 11, here's some people who did not ever give up in the fight. Did they fail from time to time? Sure. We all make mistakes. We all sin. I'll be the first to admit it. But that doesn't define who I am. It doesn't define who you are. You repent of it and you move on. I don't understand how the drunk can still be called a drunk after 20 years of sobriety. No! (laughs) It's irrelevant. That's, those sins are forgiven and forgotten, right? So the first one, as simple as it may be, and we could spend years dealing with it alone, love Jesus. That's what we talked about in class this morning. Fear, perfect fear, cast out. I was going to say cast out love. Perfect love casts out fear. There's my dyslexia. Perfect love casts out fear. We're not motivated because of what's going to happen to us. We're motivated eventually because we love God. And in truth, in the same context, in 1 John chapter 4, He first loved us. And so the first, right out the gate, in my mind, to combat a wicked world and not be the victim, not to give in, you love Jesus. John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's all you got to do. That's all you got to do right there. Secondly, appreciate what God has given us. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 4, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Nothing lacking. He's given us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame. That goes back to Noah, right? Before Him in love. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the kingdom, excuse me, uh, let me start over. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of, of God and of Jesus our Lord, as His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of Him, through the knowledge of Jesus Christ, who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. We talked about that this morning in Bible class. That's what God wants us to be. 
like Him. Holy as He is holy. 1 Peter chapter 1. To be righteous as He is righteous. 1 John chapter 5. He wants us to be with Him. In fact, if we're not holy, righteous, just, pure, godly, guess where we are? We're on the other side. There's no riding the fence. You're no longer in Christ. You're no longer serving God. In fact, we'll see here in just a moment, we don't have any righteousness. So He wants us to be a partaker of His divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. We, when we understood the difference between good and evil, we got away from evil as much as possible and cling to God, our Savior. It's the whole purpose of God's Word. All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God is proper for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped unto every good work. Lacking nothing, right? The third, we add to our faith so that we will never stumble. Do we believe in the promises of God or not? So, in Second Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 5, but also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, we're growing in these what has been stamped Christian graces. You will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. To what end? Now that I have the knowledge of Jesus Christ, I know the difference between good and evil. I know how I need to live my life to be like Christ. That's the whole point to be disciples of Christ, followers of Christ, to be a Christian, to be Christ-like. And that's how I do it. I add to my faith, virtue, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. And if I do those things, I'll never stumble. That's the promise. He doesn't stop there. Here's the negative. In verse 9, For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. He's become hardened. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly, not by the skin of our teeth. We're assured by the promise of God. That's a wonderful thing. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Four, be prepared to fight. When we become Christians, oh boy, does it ever begin. We're, we're standing here after... Benji got baptized a couple of weeks ago. I don't know, maybe I'm the bearer of the bad, of bad news. I said, you better be ready. The devil's going to be after you. You better be ready to put up your dukes. It is a fight for your life. But James chapter 4 and verse 17 says, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. That's all you got to do is resist the devil. Love God. Love Jesus. You know, Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Resist the devil, he'll flee from you. Add these Christian graces, you'll never stumble. We can resist and get away. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted above what you're able to bear, but with the temptation will always make a way of escape. Remember verse 9? Of Second Peter, what was that? Um, Second Peter uh, four, Second Peter two. That he knows how to deliver the righteous. He knows. He understands. He's there to help us. 
And so we put on the whole armor of God because we know what we're up against. We're ready to fight. And so we gird our waist with truth. We put on the breastplate of righteousness. We shot our feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We have the shield of faith. What does it say about the shield of faith? With which we will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. There's not one dart that can be shot to you from the devil that we cannot overcome if we have the proper faith. You take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always, because you're not alone. We're not alone in this fight. We're supposed to be helping one another, not hindering, not putting a stumbling block in front of one another, not discouraging, but helping one another along this fight. And that's what brings us to our fifth, that we're not alone. We've got to help one another, right? The Lord is our helper in Hebrews chapter 13. Verses 5-6, through six, But he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? That's confidence. That's not arrogance. That's saying, I'm obedient to you, God, and you're going to help me all along the way. You're trusting in him. Some very comforting words found in Hebrews chapter 2, 14-18 in which Jesus comes and He puts on the flesh. You know, He doesn't give aid to angels. It would seem that as soon as the angel sins, that's it. There's no second chance. Done. But for us, He's sympathetic to us. He, he helps us along the way. In Hebrews chapter 4, He's our high priest who sympathizes with our weaknesses. Yet in all points, uh, uh, he was he was tempted in all points yet without sin, but he still sympathizes with our struggle from time to time. And in verse 18, it says, For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Isn't that wonderful assurance? And then lastly, we must practice righteousness. In John, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 7, Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. So if I were to ask you to raise your hand and ask you, are you righteous? Why would you be reluctant to say, yes, I'm righteous? That's not arrogance. We're righteous because we're followers of Jesus Christ. We've submitted to him. Have you not submitted to him? Are you in sin? Are you living in sin? Are you practicing evil? Or are you practicing righteousness? Which one is it? Now I understand how it can come across as being arrogant. But it is our faith in Jesus Christ. Should the centurion have put his head down and walked away beaten when Christ says, I have found no such great faith? No, not in Israel. This man stands out. Now I understand if we're, we're calling ourselves righteous, it sounds pretty self-righteous. I understand. But keep in mind, you couldn't be humble. I mean, you can't be righteous and not be humble. You can't be just and not humble. You can't be pure and not humble. But we're to help one another. Wickedness and evil existed then and now. And so does righteousness. Why? Because you're righteous. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light into the world. You are a city set up on a hill that cannot be hidden. To what end? That others may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. We don't bring the glory to ourselves, but that still doesn't equate, I mean, it doesn't negate that, that we are righteous and holy and pure and perfect without blemish by the blood of the Lamb. That's what He's called us to be. So Christians have to stop playing the victim card. The victim of society. 
victim of their upbringing, victim of their circumstances. No. In Romans chapter 6, in verse 13, and do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as righteous, uh, instruments of righteousness to God. In Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 13, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodly, ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. That's our, our purpose. How could you be in sin and sinning on a regular basis, practicing sin, and be any be, be effective in trying to reach the lost? I don't know. But that's why you and I are the righteous. Just like Noah was the preacher of righteousness, and he's going and trying to save the world. He wasn't with them. In Romans chapter 6, verses 17 through 22, But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, in other words, we relished in sin. We couldn't get enough. Contrary to that, on the other side, he says, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. In other words, you didn't have any at all. But now you're full of righteousness, complete. What fruit did you have then in those things which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness in the end, everlasting life. Wow. That's an assurance. That's a guarantee. And we should feel good about that. We should feel thankful. The Israelites in ex escaping Egyptian bondage didn't go, I hope we can go into Canaan. Well, they might have, but shame on them. They didn't get to go because they rebelled. I'll guarantee you, Joshua and Caleb didn't feel that way. They were like, bring it on. Let's go. Let's go. Come on. What are we waiting for? And that's the same attitude we should have. Not out of arrogance, but out of the assurance, the promise, the confidence we have in God in keeping His promises, keeping what He said He would do. Not because we've earned it, not because I deserve it, but because I'm sacrificially day in and day out giving myself to Him. Never in that sense worthy, although I can turn to passages and say that we can be worthy, but we, we understand that we, we have to have that humility. But that's that balance that I talked about a couple of weeks ago that you're not being arrogant, but boy, it sounds arrogant. And you're confident, but it's not in you. It's in the promise of God. And so in Matthew chapter 25, we're almost done. Verse 46, and these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And so we aspire to be righteous as Noah was righteous, as Lot was righteous in a very, very wicked world. In fact, Noah and Lot really is not our aspiration, is it? Now, they've proved it's possible. They were in the flesh, just like you and I are in the flesh. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13 we read. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know, that you may know 
that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Verse 11, let's back up. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. Why do we have this assurance? Why can we boldly say? Why can we say confidently? I am righteous, I am holy, I am pure, I am perfect. I am undefiled by the blood of the Lamb, and I am going to heaven. Because of 1 John chapter 3 and verse 7. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 7. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous. Just as he is Righteous. God wants us to know we have eternal life. Not a big question mark over our heads. Not a hope in that sense. But just as Joshua and Caleb were ready to go into that promised land, it's been handed to them. He says, they are our bread. We're going to devour them. It's because we aspire to be like God. Righteous, holy, pure, undefiled, just, and perfect. And in fact, there are those who have gone before us who are. And so, finally, we refuse to be victims. Victims to our adversary. Rather, we are victors in Jesus Christ our Lord. We've already won the battle in that sense. We've already acquired eternal life in Christ Jesus right now. In other words, if you were to take your last breath right now, you have eternal life. We're victors because of what Christ has done for us, not for what we've done for Him. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, it is not of works that we should boast. We're saved by grace. The grace of God. So may we boldly say, against our adversary, against all odds, you might say, but not when you're on the Lord's side. That if we're faithful to Him, He'll give us that crown of righteousness. In fact, where is your name written right now? Right now, where is your name written? In the book of life. Don't let it get blotted out. Serving with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength to your dying day. If we can help you, won't you come?